It is a great, great blessing to be an American. Have you thought lately? If you're like me, you think about it from time to time. We could have been born in China or Bangladesh or Saudi Arabia or Iran or Iraq or Afghanistan. By the grace of God, we were born in America, and we're Americans. It's even a greater blessing to be a Christian in America. It's a double blessing. It's an incredible blessing, one of which we really have no clue. To be a Christian in America, but we have the freedom to meet together in a place like this and worship the Lord Jesus Christ without any fear of persecution. That is a blessing. That we and so many other Christians take for granted. And God forgive us. Peter wrote this letter while Nero was emperor of Rome. He wrote during a time of great, of incredible persecution for Christians. But even though he was a persecuted person, he was free in Jesus Christ. You see, we have the best of both worlds. We live in a free society, and we also have the opportunity to be set free for eternity in Jesus Christ. But freedom is never free. Freedom is never free. Freedom always costs someone something. One of the costs for freedom in America is sacrifice. So what can we learn this morning about sacrifice in a free society? You see, the title of the sermon is Submission in a Free Society. What can we learn about sacrifice in a free society? We're going to consider three temptations in this passage that can hinder us from living a sacrificial life. for Jesus Christ this morning. Let's look first at the temptation to enjoy the fruits of citizenship without tending to the tree of liberty. I tried to make these points so they'd be easy for you to remember. First Peter 2, 13 and 14. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. This passage of Scripture begins a, a section of 1 Peter that begins here and goes all the way through chapter 3 and verse 12 where Peter teaches the principle of submission. To authority. In verse 13, he makes a general statement concerning submission. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. The word ordinance there is oftentimes interpreted institution. So the idea here is since God is a God of order, he has established the principle of orderly institutions in society. Institutions such as family. The first institution. And government and industry. 
And of course, within each of these institutions, there are relationships of authority and submissiveness. So immediately after this introductory statement, Peter began a discourse on the institution of government. God established the institution of government to bring order to society. And of course, with any other human institution, it's not perfect. Now understand, don't misunderstand me, there's a distinction here that we have to see. God's principle is perfect. But our governments are, as humans are not perfect. All systems of government have their shortcomings. They're all, in one way or another, tainted with the stain of sin. Now, we think, and I think, and you think, we've got a pretty good system here in America. I like our system. I like freedom. We've got a good system of government here. We cherish the idea of democracy. We like government of the people and by the people and for the people. But we have to understand that our Constitution was written assuming, and remember, you remember last week? Well, let me remind you, because I didn't either. We talked last week about the danger of assuming. The danger of assumptions. But we have to understand that our Constitution was written assuming that the citizens of our country would be moral, God-fearing people. That's the only way a democracy can work. Because a democracy becomes whatever the people are. If the, if the, democ if the, if the people are pagan, immoral, and violent, then the democracy will become pagan, immoral, and violent. But that's democracy at its worst. To have democracy at its best, we have to sacrifice. We all as individuals must sacrifice something for the good of all. And sometimes that's hard. In fact, most of the time, that's tough. Who likes to send their sons and daughters off to war? Who likes to pay taxes? I don't even like driving the speed limit. But we all have to sacrifice something for the good of us all. There is a temptation to enjoy the fruits of citizenship without tending to the tree of liberty. Harry Emerson Fosdick was a preacher of yesteryear. He died in 1969. He was born in the late 1800s. Harry Emerson Fosdick was a very liberal preacher. He opposed conservative Christianity. He was a very liberal Christian. He preached a sermon years and years ago entitled Parking on Someone Else's Nickel. Maybe you've heard of this sermon. It's really a great sermon. Parking on Someone Else's Nickel. Before I can go any further, I'm making, I have to make an assumption here. And we know that's dangerous. So how many of you know, and, and I really need to see your hands, or I'm going to have to back up and do some splaining. How many of you know what a parking meter is? Okay, good. We can go on. That's what he meant. Parking on someone else's nickel. And let's face it, every one of us have done that before. I mean, what a blessing. You go up to the front of the car on the sidewalk and there's still time. On the meter, it hasn't expired yet. And if you get an errand to run and you're fast enough, you can go and run your errand and get back to your car. And you can park on someone else's nickel. 
How many times have you done that? How many times have you parked in front of a parking meter only to be delighted to find there's still time on it? Well, that's what that is. That's parking on someone else's nickel. And that's a problem in our nation today. Because you see, most of us didn't earn the freedoms we enjoy. Most of us didn't fight on foreign soil. Most of us are parking on someone else's nickel. As a matter of fact, we all are. A week or two weeks ago, Emily and I were in the World War II Museum in New Orleans. And we toured that museum. Let me tell you what, we're all parking on someone else's nickel. If you don't think so, just go visit that museum. Every single one of us, we're parking on someone else's nickel. I'm grateful to be an American. You're grateful. But not only does that give us great privilege, it gives us great responsibility. So ask yourself this morning, is this a better country because I'm in it? Is this a better community because I'm a part of it? Is this a better church because I'm a member of it? You see, the question for us this morning is, is not are we parking on someone else's nickel or we are. The question for us this morning is, are we putting money in the meter? That's the question for us. Are we doing our share for our country and our community and our church? The second temptation is the temptation to enjoy the benefits of capitalism while ignoring the responsibility of morality. I told you I made an easy to remember. Verses 15 and 16 says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. I, I praise God for capitalism. I studied capitalism. I went to business school. Tina went to business school with me. And we in, in business school, we studied capitalism. Capitalism, and I praise God for capitalism. God has used the free market system of our government to make our country very, very blessed and very, very wealthy. And by the way, we are still the greatest nation on the face of the earth this morning. We're blessed. And God has done a lot of good through America, through capitalism. But our forefathers assumed that above everything else, we would strive to be bond servants of God. And there's that word again, assume. But they did. There are certain assumptions in the Constitution. And they assumed that above all else, we would strive to be bond servants of God. You see, capitalism without a conscience is a cruel way of life. If we sacrifice morality for materialism, we get immorality and crime. A man wrote a letter to Ann Landers. It's kind of like the parking meter thing. You guys know who Ann Landers was? A man wrote a letter to Ann Landers, and he says in his letter, this is for the woman who is distressed about her son. I would like to ask her some questions about the boy. Is he disrespectful? Has he been arrested for drunk driving? Has he been kicked out of college for cheating? Has he gotten his girlfriend pregnant? Does he steal money? If you can answer no to all these questions, stop complaining. You have a great kid. End quote. Now, Ann Landers has passed away. 
And I didn't always agree with what Ann Landers wrote. But I respected her opinion, and I respected her conviction. And I especially appreciated how, re how she responded to this particular letter. She answered back, and she wrote, Your letter showed just how much times have changed. You said that if a kid today isn't on drugs, doesn't cheat, hasn't been arrested for drunk driving, hasn't gotten his girlfriend pregnant or stolen money, he's a great kid, but you make no mention of achievement. There wasn't a word about integrity or responsibility, morality or service to others. Then she added, what a sad, sad commentary on our times. Where is our nation headed and who is going to lead us there? End quote. You see, we're tempted to want the blessings of capitalism at the expense of morality. The third temptation I want us to consider this morning is to want Christianity without a commitment. To want Christianity without commitment. Verse 17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Ten years ago, many of you won't, can't, will not be able to believe it was ten years Ten years ago, in June of 2002, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco ruled that the Pledge of Allegiance is unconstitutional because it contains the words, under God. Some of you may remember that in March of 2010, the court reversed that rule, upholding under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. But it took eight years. That 2002 ruling, I believe, is the most ridiculous ruling I've ever heard in my life come from a court. For a court that was established to protect and interpret a constitution that was written to guide a moral people in a moral nation to rule that the words under God is unconstitutional is unthinkable. Because God is the basis of all morality. And I know that ruling was reversed, but to even consider it is troubling and frightening. Because I got news for you, if the Pledge of Allegiance, if the Pledge of Allegiance is unconstitutional, then so is the Declaration of Independence because it contains references to God. So is our national anthem. You just saw the words of the second verse. It's unconstitutional. <laughs> if the Pledge of Allegiance is unconstitutional, then where are we as a nation? To want a country that is not under God is to turn our backs on our entire history and heritage and who we are. It's to, it's to ignore our, our foundation of who we really are. Jamestown, one of the earliest settlements in America, built a building in the very center of their town. And it wasn't City Hall. You know what it was. It was a church. And everything they did revolved around the church. The church became the hub of the town. Our first universities, Yale and Harvard, they were not established to train liberal lawyers. They were established and founded to train preachers to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. President John Quincy Adams, the president, the president, John Quincy Adams, wrote, and I quote, the highest glory of the American revelation, revolution was that it connected the principles of Christianity with the principles of government. End quote. That's what he said. Look at your money. Praise God, you'll still find the mockery. In God we trust. There is no doubt 
about it. Our nation was founded upon the idea that we are a people submissive to the authority of an almighty God. That's who we are. And our forefathers assumed that when they wrote the Constitution. There are clearly assumptions to the authority of Almighty God in the Constitution. But we have to be careful there. I'll never forget 9-11. It was a Tuesday morning. I was working on my doctorate, and I was at home working that morning. I'd worked all night, studied all night, and I was still working at home when it happened. Tina called me and told me about it, and I turned on the television, and, you know, just like you did. I went over to the church, and I just opened, I just unlocked all the doors there preach, in mo like in most places, we have to lock the doors of the church. And I unlocked all the doors, and people just started coming in, and just coming to the, to the altar, and just praying silently and leaving. And in the days that followed, people began to come to me and say, you know, this is really a hidden blessing, because God's going to bring a great revival as a result of this. And I can remember me saying, and, and, and it had to come from God because, number one, I'm not smart enough. And number two, it was, it, it was prophetic. I said, no. No. You see, when the, when the authors of the Constitution wrote the Constitution, they weren't writing about just any God. When they wrote the Declaration of Independence, they weren't thinking about just any old God. When Francis Scott Key wrote the Star-Spangled Banner, he wasn't thinking about just any generic God. God, they were thinking about the one true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Congress can stand on the steps of the Capitol and sing, God bless America, and that God can be anyone or anything. We live in politically correct times. To some people, Allah is their God. To others, his name is Buddha. But for the vast majority of our founding fathers, and this is indisputable, they were Christian. They were Christian. And Jesus Christ is the God they had in mind when they established this nation. And that's undeniable truth. You've heard this story before. Upon returning home after a visit to America in 1831, the French philosopher, the French writer, Alexis de Tocqueville, he wrote, and I quote, I sought the greatness of the United States in her, in her commodious harbors, her ample rivers, her fertile fields, and boundless forests, but it was not there. I sought it in her rich mines, her vast world commerce, her public school system, and in her institutions of higher learning, and it was not there. I looked for it in her democratic congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches in America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good, and if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. There's a growing temptation in our churches to want Christianity without commitment. And that won't work. America is only as strong as the church. 
And the church is only as strong as we, the individual members, are committed to the cause of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatness of our country comes down to the greatness of our commitment to the cause of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are you doing for the Lord? Ask yourself this question. What are you doing for the Lord through his church? How are you doing in your service for Christ? Are you parking on someone else's nickel? Or are you putting money in the meter? We've got the best of both worlds. We're free in America. We can be free in Christ. But freedom always costs someone something. Always. Freedom is never free. Let me tell you what, Northgate Baptist Church needs us. And we need her. So we have to ask ourselves the question, are we parking on someone else's nickel? Or are we putting money in the meter? Northgate needs us, especially now, to put money in the meter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our great nation and for the freedoms we enjoy. We ask your forgiveness. for the times we take them for granted. God, we pray that our commitment to you would be made manifest in our attendance and our coming and our going for the Lord Jesus Christ through his church at Northgate. We pray that our commitment be expressed through the giving of our tithes and our offerings, which are yours. God, we pray this morning you would open our eyes to the truth that, oh, this is a blessed nation. And we are a blessed people. And you have given us opportunity and resources. And we are stewards of what you have given to us. And may you convict us even now and in the days to come this week to reflect upon these verses and your truth that we would be good stewards of all that you've entrusted into our hands. Mainly, most importantly, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, we pray for our mission team as they are on mission in Massachusetts this morning, as they worship even now. And God, we pray that your Holy Spirit fall upon those people in such a mighty way that they nor we would ever forget. May you glorify yourself through your church at Northgate. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're here today and, and, and you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you desperately need Jesus. And maybe you don't realize that. But perhaps the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes to it. We call that conviction. And you just come and obey him as he leads you. If you're here today and you're not sure that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven, you have to make sure. You have to put your faith in Jesus. You do that today. Maybe you know that you're a Christian. 
There's no doubt about that. But God has also reminded today that parking on someone else's nickel. It's time to put money in the meter. In your time. Maybe you want to do it right where you are or, or come to the altar and pray and just give it all to God. Got news for you, it's his anyway. Give it back. Maybe God is calling you to join this church today. I don't know how he's speaking, but I know he's speaking because he's speaking to me.